everyone again um, do quick introductions via the chat just to honor the time that we have together. And also, um, if you have any announcements, we do have an announcement that we're going to share. But if you have any um, that you like to <laughs> add to the chat or um, I think you can add attachments for flyers, that would be wonderful. Um, and I believe we can also collect all of those and, and share them out via email also after. So we're then going to go into an overview of the Hamden County uh, Health Improvement Plan, as well as the timeline. We'll go into our community team updates and presentations, and then we'll give everyone a little bit of a break and then come back and do some reflecting and sharing in breakout rooms, come back to the flow group and share out what, uh, what we've learned from each other, and then uh, chat a little bit about next steps. There we go. Uh, this is just one announcement and Becky, you can feel free to chime in. Um, there's a grant opportunity being provided to the community health and healthy aging funds. Um, it's around policy systems, environment change, healthy aging, gateway cities and rural areas, and also community health improvement planning. The grant is due June 10th and the link should be in the chat. I think Becky's gonna place it in the chat. I'll do that in a minute. <laughs> oh, I'm sorry, I had, had that on mute for some reason. I didn't hear what you said, Becky. Oh. Um, I, yeah, I'll put that in the chat right now. Okay, cool. So yeah, if anyone wants to take advantage of this grant opportunity, feel free to, uh, to click the link. Okay. Um, yeah, so these, these are the funds that are currently funding our work um, through Mass DPH and, and we have funding through 2025. Um, so as uh, a lead agency, PBPC is not eligible to apply for these funds, um, but it's really the work that everyone is doing. So we want to make sure that, that you guys look into this and um, any organizations or partnerships that want to apply for funds, please do so. Um, and you can let us know if you want um, some collaborators. We're, we're help, happy to work with you on that. But please look into these grants because they're, they're what funds all of our work. Um, so I just wanted to go into a... Um, history of the chip. Um, I won't read all of this, but, um, and, and you've, many of you have seen this before. Um, so the chip was started, the Hamden County Health Improvement Plan. Um, back in 2014, Dr. Frank Robinson um, convened public health officials and organizations um, to talk about creating a Hamden County Health Improvement Plan. And that was really based on the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation County Health Rankings. Um, Hamden County had been ranking last since the development of those rankings. Um, unfortunately, we're still last. Um, and normally this time of year, we would be presenting, um, you know, if any changes have come up, um, but I'll get into that a little bit later. Um, so in developing the chip, we use the Worcester chip as a model. Um, we have very limited funding. Um, PVPC convened partner organizations. Uh, we wrote the chip based on the most recent county health needs assessments for area hospitals. Um, and the document was finalized in 2017. So that's the document that we've been working with um, since 2017. Um, in 2018, we, we got funding from Bay State, um, to, which funded PVPC and, and the Public Health Institute for three years to convene member organizations um, and to start implementing CHIP strategies. And part of that grant included mini grant, uh, $10,000 for mini grants, um, which we ended up uh, 
not using until last or the last couple of years, just because we were originally um, offering very small grants and we increased it to $5,000, which was a lot more useful for, for folks. Um, the main team started meeting in 2019 to start selecting strategies for implementation. In 2020, um, we formed a design team made up of representatives from each domain team. Um, and we got the, the grant that I was talking about earlier. Um, and PHI is really subcontracted to be our partner in uh, facilitating community teams and these quarterly meetings. Uh, we did hold trainings in 2021 or 2020 and 2021 on a history of race, racism and racial equity and policy systems and environment change. Um, and in 2021, started working on the website and we changed the name of the domain teams to community teams because in, in developing the website, we really were looking at language um, to make it more welcoming and really to make it more of a community um, community oriented project. Um, so right now we're starting to plan for updating the chip. Um, and this meeting is really about looking where we looking at what we've been working on in the last couple of years um, or what you all have been working on, um, evaluating the process that we've been using and what the outcomes have been to date. Um, so I have a few slides just to, again, sort of talk about the relationship between community health needs assessments and the CHIP. Um, so the community health needs assessments are mandated through the Affordable Care Act um, that hospitals have to develop these every three years. Um, and the, and there's um, uh, they're being worked on now. Um, for the, all the hospitals in the region. Um, there's a collaborative that works on the, the four base state hospitals in Mercy, um, and then Holyoke Medical Center is doing their own CHINA. And then the Community Health Improvement Plan or County Health Improvement Plan is a multi-sector and multi-agency collaboration. It's supposed to be community driven and hospitals are just one of many partners. Um, and this is a, a process that's endorsed by Mass DPH. Um, this is a diagram that sort of shows the development of the Chanel. Brittany, Brittany, I think, created this, this diagram a couple of years ago. Um, so the, it's made it up, there's a coalition of hospitals and insurers, um, a regional consultant team, and then community members. Um, all this goes into the development of the Chanel. Um, and with the CHINAs, um, the hospitals develop their implementation strategies. Um, we use the CHINAs, the data from the CHINAs to um, update the chip and develop new chips. Um, there is a, another or another group in the region that's developing a, an, a chip for the northern or for the Quebec Hills area. Um, and then helps organizations develop strategic plans. Um, Another way to put it is a community health improvement process looks outside of the performance of an individual organization serving a specific segment of a community to the way in which the activities of many organizations contribute to community health improvement. Um, so I just wanted to, to highlight that, that you know, this is a collaborative, um, we're looking at the chip as you know, how do all the, our organ, our organizations come together to create something bigger. Um, this is a diagram of the CHIP process. It's really a circular process. Um, the, CHINA develop, the CHINAs, again, go um, are part of the data collection and prior, prioritization process. Um, and then they are communicated through um, the, the final reports. Um, we've been in the planning implementation strategies and implementation phase for a couple of years. Um, and now we're sort of at the point of evalu evaluating progress and reflecting. Um, I should say today we were going to have um, some data presentation from uh, Public Health Institute on the data they've been collecting for the CHMAS. Um, but we decided um, to hold off on that until the next meeting just because um, they're working on a, on a strict deadline for the Chinas, and we also have plenty to, to present in terms of uh, what the community teams have been working on. 
So going forward, um, we want to continue to expand the understanding of structural racism and how to disrupt structural racism and improve equity through the CHIP. Um, and we've asked each community team to think about how the strategies they're implementing um, do that, you know, improve equity or and or disrupt structural racism. Um, so that's really the underlying concept um, that we all should be working from. Then we also want to understand what's happening beyond the chip network. Um, so uh, we've started to create a list of networks and coalitions that are doing work to improve health in Hamden County. Um, we have included that list with a membership survey that we'll be um, sending out uh, during this meeting and after this meeting. And we really hope everyone will fill that out. I know there's a lot of surveys going around this time of year, but um, it's really important to, to understand where we are and how you all feel about how things are going. Um, and then we want to build on assets and successes and support work that member organizations and other collaboratives are doing um, and document that work. Um, so We've talked a little bit in the design team and, and among the backbone organizations about, you know, we've been looking at the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation data for several years. It's always a little depressing because it doesn't move. It's hard to show how our work really moves that needle. Um, so we're thinking about, you know, moving forward, really trying to build on the successes and assets that we have in the region um, to make that, you know, to, to, to look at work that's really tangible and makes real change. Um, and then we're gonna look at community team focus areas, you know, what's missing, who's already doing this work and other coalitions and how can we uplift what's already in place. So um, now we're at the point of community team updates. And these are three questions that we ask each um, community team to answer. So. What have you been working on since the last chip network meeting? Uh, what outcomes can you report on from this work and how does this work improve equity and or disrupt structural racism? So we actually have um, a little bit of time if anyone has any um, initial questions or questions on that brief history. And if not, we can we can move on to the community team updates. Becky, I have one question. Yes. I want to make sure I heard correctly. So the Holyoke Health Center is doing their own chinas separate from the other chinas? Yeah. Can that if, you, if you'd like, Becky. Sure. Um, great question, Liz. So yeah, Holyoke Medical Center does their step outside of what we call the coalition of hospitals with Cooley Dickinson Mercy and the base A hospitals in Health New England. Um, and that's just been because they had a series of you know leadership transitions and they haven't been able to kind of integrate back in the group, but we do um, touch base often with the person who oversees the channel and try to share data and information as much as we can. Excellent. And we make sure that we capture uh, this is going to sound like a statement, but it's really a question. I'll ask it this question. Are we making sure that we capture what comes out of the Holyoke Chana in the broader chip and, and with each of the communities or domains? Um, because many of those things I know are the same um, that we identify as high need or high priority, but the Holyoke um, is really smart because I, I mean, everybody's really smart, but they're smart in a different way, I think, because they're smaller. And sometimes they lift up things that I, as somebody living in Springfield, I sort of know, but haven't noticed as much. And I just want to make sure that we capture all of the good learning from all of our partners. Yeah, that's a really good point, Liz. Um, and we have been, you know, we, we were working closely with Kathy Anderson until she left. Um, but yes, we'll continue to work closely with um, with the Holyoke Medical Center. They've been a really good partner um, and integrate the outcomes from their chana into the updated chip. Nairobi Rosa serves on chip and our design team and is really connected with their chana process and is always keeping us updated too. Yeah. I thought so. Great. 
Great to hear it said out loud, though, and for those people who don't work as closely with Holyoke to know that how amazing they are there. Thanks. The new person already started, in, uh, and it will be nice to engage her again to be part of the broader China. Who was that, Anna? I believe it's Sharon Ro Robert. Oh, the new person? Sherilyn Roberts, I believe, is the new person. I could be wrong, but I, I believe it's her. Okay. I haven't heard that. She's my manager, so I have not heard that announcement. I don't know. I, I just heard it in another meeting. That's what I'm saying. Don't take my words. But I believe, I believe it was what I heard. Okay. Unless it's somebody else with very similar <laughs> name. Yeah. Okay, well, Marissa will keep us up up to date on that um, yeah okay um any other quick questions okay if not i'll share my screen again and um Livana's gonna moderate the community team updates thanks becky um I'm, for those of you who don't know me, I'm Levana Homestead. I work with Tiffany at the Public Health Institute of Western Mass, um, and I, am, I facilitate community team too. Um, and I'm excited to hear from everyone's team about what they've been working on and any progress that's been made. So we're going to be, for the sake of timing, um, and with some of the um, strive folks from community team three that I think have to leave a little early. We're going to, um, they're going to kick us off with their updates first. Uh, so I'm going to hand it over to them in just a second. Uh, because we were able, or we have a little bit more room in our agenda without having the Chana data being presented this time, every group will have about 15 minutes um, and we'll have some questions at the end of each, some time for questions at the end of each um update before we move on to the next one so um we have a little bit more time <laughs> maybe you won't feel quite as rushed although i'm not quite so sure about that um so i'll hand it over to levana just very quickly um just wanted to share with everyone to keep us on track i'm going to be a little bit of a timekeeper so i'll let you know when you have 2 minutes left to your presentation and i'll just I'll just play this little. Might want to turn it up a little. <laughs> a year now. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. I'll play that when it's time. Thanks, okay. Tiffany. All right. So I'm going to hand it over to community team three. Um, we'll go from there. Okay. I think uh, Libby. Is Libby on? Hi. Well, I go, it says Elizabeth, but I'm Libby. Hello. <laughs> Just tell me when to move the slides. All right. Wonderful. Thank you so much for um, being flexible um, and allowing us to go first. And, and hopefully we'll, I'll get to stay for as long as possible. I'm really, really eager to hear about what's going on in, other, in the other projects. So today I'm going to talk to y'all about our project that we're doing in Springfield using youth participatory action research. And um, so briefly, Youth, Particip Youth Participatory Action Research, or YPAR, um, is meant to build capacity for young folks and help them to communicate their lived experience. And it's really meant to center communities as the experts in their um, in the things that are going on in their communities and elevate their voices. And 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 um, they're also young people are particularly aware of what's going on in their lives, and they also are extremely creative and resourceful and have ideas about um, solutions that could be used to address issues going on in their community. And so we use YPAR as this methodology. And it's, um, we're going to present findings from our study. And 
The purpose of the study is to explore the influence of structural violence on adolescent sexual and reproductive health inequities from the population most affected, which is young people um, in Springfield. And particularly, or in particular, we were focused on recruiting young people um, on the margin. So folks who wouldn't necessarily have their voice heard in this process. So we're thinking, so um, in term that that we're really looking at low income housing unstable, um, youth of color, queer youth, and they're often um, youth living with a disability. And there's lots of intersections of those identities within the young people that um, participated in this project. And you can go ahead and change the slide. So again, um, so just actually, just to give you a little bit of um, a bigger picture. So this study that, um, that we're presenting on is funded by the Massachusetts Department of of public health and the chip funds have been used to enhance the project by um, paying for transportation for the young people to participate. So the overarching goal is um, to use participatory research methods to examine how structural racism in combination with other systems of oppression contributes to inequitable adolescent sexual and reproductive health outcomes for youth. And these data are meant to inform current and future efforts by Massachusetts Department of Public Health. Uh, MDPH is really interested in hearing directly from young people. And I'll, we'll talk a little bit more about how we're going to remove ourselves as middle people to make sure that they have the opportunity to talk directly. You can go ahead and change the slide. Thank you. Um, for the third time, I apologize. Um, sometimes these things get repetitive, but the theme of our of, of this project and the theme of a retreat that we did that the transportate that um, uh, the chip helped helped support um, was a youth participatory action research photo voice retreat focused on systemic issues that affect young people in Springfield and their sexual and reproductive health. And we partnered with Gandhara in their um, their impact center, which is a kind of a pivot point for young folks who are living on the mar margins to get help to spend time during the day to get connected to resources and to ha um, be ha have have some adult support in their lives that that they may not otherwise have. And as I mentioned, the setting is in Springfield metro area. We had eight youth participate as youth researchers. And they identified as Black or African-American, Latinx, Latino, Latina, or Latine, uh, LGBTQIA, or queer, low income, housing unstable, and or living with a disability. And you can change it. Um, oh, you can change it again, sorry. It looks like a repeat. So the photo voice retreat what took place over the course of two days. And we did this on purpose because, as I mentioned, we were trying to reach folks that would otherwise be more harder to reach. Um, and we're thinking about folks that are more transient in nature. If they don't have housing, um, if they're going from shelter to shelter or couch to couch, we really wanted to hear from them and engage them, not just in this photo voice retreat, but also there are opportunities for them to continue to be engaged in this project. And we're going to talk more about that. So um, in order to make it, to, in order for them to be able to complete the entire process in a consolidated amount of time, we did it over a weekend in November this past year. and we focused on first identity building and really um, building, helping to facilitate the building of community across the young people to see how, what the kinds of things they had in common. And then they talked about, um, they mapped, they did community mapping where, and they, they mapped the, the safe places in their community and what that meant for them. And then, and, and by safe, we mean physically safe, um, also places that um, help their health, and then also for places that they avoid, places that they don't feel safe in. And again, this was part of their cohort building or their identity building around identifying ways that they relate to one another. And then we focused on risk factors for adolescents. Oh my gosh, I apologize. Um, 
this this presentation um, is, and this slide is pulled from a different presentation, but risk factors for not substance use, but um, risk factors around their health. And then based on that discussion, they developed a photo voice prompt. And we're gonna talk a little bit more about what photo voice is for those of y'all who might not be familiar. Um, but essentially it is phot photography as a research method where folks learn how, um, and I say learn, but they don't really learn because we, we 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 realize that like young people are way more um, skilled at taking pictures with their phones than adults are, and so they did a fantastic job um, navigating the photo the photo voice process. But they learned about the ethics of photo voice and really making sure um, not to take like not to take pictures of particular people and to be careful about the spaces that they took that they took pictures of. Um, but then they went out you into the community and they took pictures of the things that they felt like made them feel safe and the places that didn't make them feel safe. And that was related to community mapping. And then they brought all of those pictures back together and we did a group debrief. And then we had another set of discussions around the big structural factors in their lives that impact their, their sexual and reproductive health. And then they developed a prompt based on that. And they went out again this is on day two and took pictures of, of those elements and then came back and they presented again to each other. And then we looked at all the collection of photos. Um, they also write a narrative around it and they presented to each other. And then we kind of talked about everything and kept looking for themes that continued to come up and differences that came, to, that came up. And then based on that an analysis, um, they decided they developed an action plan about what they wanted to do with the data that they had. You can change the slide now. Okay. Um, so these are photos that are taken by young people. The names that are listed are pseudonyms. Um, they are protected. Um, through uh, this, this because this is human subjects re research. This this project has um, IR, has um, internal review board approval from the University of Massachusetts. And um, I'll go ahead and do the first one, and then Lynn, you can you can jump on to do the next one. So, the young people talked a lot about the impact of racism and classism on minoritized youth. Um, and again, I just want to reiterate that. What's being presented here are is directly from the youth. Um, we really see ourselves as facilitators of this process. We recognize our role as researchers, our role as um, white folks that don't live in the community, and that um, and and our role is really to is to really elevate their voices. So I just I really want to make sure that that's very clear. So. The, when they talked a lot about when they talked about racism and classism and how that influences their lives, um, they talked about it in very broadly. Um, their in, interactions in community with their school, um, with healthcare. They also talked about it more um, as something that really holds them back. And so that's the nature of this of this of this photo. And so this is a youth um, a photo that a young person took and they, they call it chains. And I'm gonna read the quote that they, or the, the narrative that they wrote with it. I think of it as the barriers that we can write down and say, this is something, there's a reason why it's systemic. You know, there's something fundamental about how much, how many things are against us. Being a first generation Puerto Rican, having to go through not only, you know, dealing with my dad and the language barriers, just feeling that sense of less than, the memory that came back was when I was trying to tell an instructor back in high school. I was like, yeah, so my name is fill in the blank. Like, that's how you say it. And he was like, no one's ever going to listen to you because you're your demographic. You're not going to get to who you want to. So I was like, that's a chain, but I'm going to break it. So I thought of words of the chain has to be broken with action. So you have to do something about it. Um, and I do, I want to say that part, as I mentioned with action planning, part of what they're going to do is meet with the Massachusetts Department of Public Health, provide action plan steps and suggestions for how to address some of the things that are coming up in their lives. And so you notice that they, they're they talking about the action piece. They're, the young people are really excited about the next stage of this project. And um, 
the opportunity to be heard. You can go ahead and change it. Alin, do you want to pop on? Sure. Um, so the next uh, theme that uh, came up in the photo work is on over-policing, not surprisingly. Um, there are a number of pictures that we're taking about police, police surveillance um, in the young people's lives. And so uh, this photo, which was titled by, I, I, don't, I don't remember if you mentioned Libby, but all of the uh, photographers or youth researchers titled their photos as well. So the title of the photo is called Safe with a question mark. And um, in writing about the photo, the photographer said, it's basically showing the like prominence of police within the community because they're putting a booth displaying Springfield police at an intersection around a common area where people are just sitting. There's an overrepresentation of police in the forces within low income neighborhoods. And obviously this exists because of racism being rooted all the way back from when the police system started. So citizens shouldn't have to feel okay with this. I don't. I wouldn't want police just right there, like 20 feet away from you. I'm just, I'm enjoying my lunch. Okay, we can go on to the next slide. Another um, major theme in the photo work and the discussion was about perceived scarcity and availability of resources. And some of this also touched on Young, uh, the photographer's re youth researcher's critique of gentrification in Springfield. So this photo is titled Pretty in Pink. And the youth researcher said, throughout the city, you see a lot of murals. You see women, you see girls, you see people of color. We're not taken care of though. So you're able to profit off of me or use us to make you look good. I see myself a lot more on these walls now, but I don't see us taken care of within the buildings. One of the things that I thought would be good was for every time you see someone represented on a mural in that same building, there should be a service, a resource, or somewhere to get information about a resource in that building or in those buildings. Okay, we can go on to the next. Um, then another major theme was on stigma and shame that hinders accessing and availability and even discussion around adolescent sexual reproductive health. So this photo is titled Unknown Help. And uh, the youth researcher, Michael, said, the stigma is so rampant and so reinforced that people aren't making use of the resources because there's a stigma of going into the clinic, same as when there's protesters outside the clinic. They make you embarrassed to go in because this particular organization, it's not just a needle exchange. It's sexual reproductive health, birth control health, all testing. They help people with birth control and breastfeeding. They set up appointments everything having to do with that and giving out contraceptives, all for free too. Okay, the next slide, please. Excuse me, two minute warning. All right, thanks. Um, uh, another theme was on representation matters. And this photo is titled, Not My Body, Not My Choice. The photographer wrote, most of the time it's old men in positions of power to enact laws to create legislation that is in control of women's bodies or not women, anyone who has certain genitalia. That's inclusive to everyone. I just thought the man cutting off the flower was a way of saying, this is not your body. You don't own it, I do. I'm the one who's deciding your health. I have your health in my hands and I have no idea what you're experiencing. And so what could happen? More diverse people, people dealing with these issues that you're creating laws for, get them in office. Okay, next slide. Okay, and one of the major themes in this work that kind of was served as an umbrella for all the other um, themes was on mental health and fractured mental health. We um, that was a major theme. So this slide is titled "Gray Rainbow." This photo shows a colorful girl in a not so colorful place, clutching her comfort toy. As colorful as I am, where I am is so desolate, alone, and depressing. No matter how hard I try, I can't be happy. We all put a smile on, even when we don't feel like smiling. Depression comes from our environment, people, places, events, etc. The photo shows my efforts to be bright and cheery, but it doesn't change how I feel mentally. The anxiety and depression will always be here. People need to take depression seriously. And the fracture was between the outside representation of kind of seeming happiness and inside how the photographer was feeling or the youth researcher. 
Okay. Um, and I'm, I think this may be about the last slide, but I'm going to end on that. Uh, the focus of YPAR is on youth voice and agency. So uh, these are some of the ways that the uh, photo work and the, the YPAR um, findings will be shared. And we're working with a number of different youth uh, uh, researcher cohorts to produce a community forum, um, to participate on a youth advisory council, each of the groups, including this one, have developed are, are working to develop a list of demands. Um, this summer, we're working on a social media campaign and and trying to produce a website and social media material around some of this work in con in collaboration with some of the youth researchers. Um, optimally, we'd have a community gala, and then finally, as Libby mentioned, uh, youth researchers or select youth researchers who want to participate, um, taking part in a Mass Department of Public Health panel and report on the findings. I think this might be the last slide. I'm not sure. Nope. Okay. Quickly, key findings to address adolescent sexual and reproductive health outcomes are that, uh, and this is again really coming from the youth researchers. The need to raise awareness of social services and sexual health resources available to historically marginalized youth and how to access them or bringing them to the young people. Um, engaging youth equitably in planning and decision making at various levels to increase access to school based programs to foster adult social support um, around interconnected structural factors, including housing, transportation and food. Um, school being a central place for young people across the board and increasing access to sex ed rooted in a culture-centered framework that goes beyond surface level mere translation into, say, another language that really addresses local cultural concerns. So that would be include collaboration between youth serving community organizations and school districts. Yeah, thank you. Thanks. We actually had some more strategies to report on, but I think we'll hold off on those just in, in the interest of time um, and maybe come back to them. Um, also wanted to say um, some of our, we have a lot of slides today. Um, and part of that was to, um, as for our evaluation. So we will distribute the slides afterwards. And um, I'm sorry, we We'll cut this off just a little bit short, um, but let's go on to um, the next one. Ivana. Well, can we, I just wanted to echo a lot of what's going on in the chat and how powerful um, those words and thoughts and photos from the youth and young people were. Um, and I think there's so much, they, youth are so incredibly smart and intuitive. Um, and really figuring out how to uplift their voices and give them agency is incredibly important. Um, so I think there's definitely some great words in the chat um, about that. And I just wanted to open it up for two minutes for any questions um, before we move on, because there was a lot that was shared. So Liz, I see your hands raised. Yeah, I, I put my comments in the chat and I was moved by the very first slide. And the thing I would say is someone who has not been a youth for a really long time, how those words resonated so deeply, like in my own life. Um, and particularly the slide with the police substation, you know, I was a part of conversations where they were planning those and thought they were doing amazing community engagement work. And it, for me, it's a bigger lesson for all of us how when we're doing our work, even with the best intent, it can land so badly um, because I have been near those substations and felt watched, even though I'm not doing anything wrong. I haven't felt comforted by them. I haven't felt more safe because of them. And I just think that slide in particular, um, you know, maybe the youth will want to construct a bigger written piece. And I think we should get it in the paper. I think that speaks to just how fractured the relationship is between police and community. And then we could all take that on as learning for our own selves in terms of, is my work landing the way I hope it will work? And if it's not, it's because I'm not talking to people in the community enough, maybe. But anyway, kudos to you. I just think that it's, this is brilliant. All, all of those slides are brilliant. 
Um, we also it would be, you know, with the newspaper sharing idea, which I think would be wonderful. Um, it would be great to have some of the background context about how those stations, those whatever they're called, the median stations came into place. Like what was the intent and now how is it perceived? Yeah. Yeah. Great, great points. Um, Alan, your hand raised. Yeah, no, I just want to echo how amazing that was. People look for authentic, you know, organizations are searching for authentic voices and those pictures and those words just were authentic. Um, the question I had was the community mapping activity, was that something you have access to as well? Or is that more of a stage to get people to that next step? Because I'm wondering if there's information in that community mapping exercise that could really also inform where people feel safe, where they don't. I thought that was really interesting. There definitely is. I mean, the community mapping is, um, you know, it's a precursor and then kind of an in-between activity, um, but definitely it gets to a lot of rich discussion about that's generated by the young people instead of us forcing it, you know, in a certain direction. And then it's builds into the prompts that are used for photo taking and then continued discussion and then more mapping, um, more discussion. So it's kind of this iterative process. Certainly there's a lot of a lot of material in there. And in, in um, writing a report on this, we looked at the community mapping discussions as well. Yeah. Okay. Anne Marie, do you have one quick question before we move on? I, yeah, I just wanted to put um, an opportunity invitation out there. Um, so, Bay State Health is finalizing our, we're working on our community health needs assessment reports. Um, and we are going to, we're going to be sending out and we'll send it with the, the chip, share it with the chip group as well. But we're going to be seeking photographs from community organizations and the community uh, to incorporate into our Chanel reports. Um, we have not incorporated photographs before. Um, and so we really want the, the look, the feel um, when people are reading the reports to, to see their community. Um, and so this was just obviously a, a beautiful um, uh what you just shared. And so I'm just putting it out there for consideration if you want to bring it back to the youth uh, to have potentially their quotes and photographs included. Um, they would get full credit and we could also explore a stipend as an appreciation for their time and work. So um, feel free to contact me. Um, I don't want to get out ahead of your kind of rollout plan um, that you shared, but just wanted to put that opportunity and invitation out there. That's a wonderful idea and a way for a lot of, you know, a lot of questions that we get from the young people are, you know, we've participated in groups like this before. What are you going to do about it? How is this going to make any change in my life? Like you're just using us again. Um, they're so bright. <laughs> and so, you know, we have to reiterate, like there are spaces for y'all. We're trying to build infrastructure. Um, we didn't because because of time we didn't have much time to present on this but young people are compensated um a hundred dollars per day or essentially 25 dollars an hour for their time and then um they also have opportunities to join the stride youth advisory council which they get paid for every time they participate and their the intention is to create infrastructure at the state level and also um we're on a, in a current project we're working with uh, square one doing um, YPAR again with another cohort. We're trying to build a youth advisory council for um, for Square One, and so like really being intentional about not just like building these building these skills in these young people and bringing them together and helping them work, you know, facilitating this process for them, and then just not like leaving them and like leaving them behind. For those of them that want to participate, we there are many opportunities for them to become embedded in these leadership. Um, positions. And one last thing I know we're finished, we're um, on time, but uh, we also currently, the this cohort produced two of our paid community researchers that are now co-facilitating as peer researchers, um, the current YPAR project that we're doing in at Square One. So I, just to make sure that folks are aware that we are, um, that there are lots of opportunities for young people to continue to be involved. Thank you, Libby. Um, I'm gonna move us on to community team two and just to make sure we're not falling too far behind. And then we can maybe circle back if there's um if we have more time um, for any other questions or comments or updates from community team two. 
So I'm going to get us started with Community Team 2 update. Um, let me share my screen. So we are the, are the behavioral health community team. Everybody see this? Okay. So um, we have been working on a couple different strategies on our work plan, basically continuation from um, the previous year. Uh, and one of those is really increasing access to Narcan. Uh, and so we have tapestry um, that have been has been doing some work as well as uh, Gondra doing a media campaign. Uh, I'm gonna hand it off to Pedro. You're on here, I believe, right? Uh, if you wanna talk a little bit about um, the uh, any training of the Narcan that Tapestry has been doing. Yeah, um, so good morning, everybody. Thanks for uh, everybody being here. Um, so what we're doing at Tapestry, trying to increase um, some Narcan trainings out in the community. We've been offering them through Zoom, um, you know, with the onset of COVID and getting into that virtual platform. Um, we're definitely taking advantage of that um, and offering the Zoom Narcan trainings. However, um, with the weather turning for the better, it's hard to get some, you know, most of the trainings are scheduled in the evenings around 6, 630. So it's hard to get people to, you know, buy into some of the trainings at that time. Most people are enjoying the days or anything like that. So we're looking at maybe changing the time of those trainings. Um, I will be updating the, um, the the tracking sheet on the Google Drive as well um, with the changes for those times as well. Um, so we're going to offer them on like a bi-weekly basis um, where individuals can just join the Zoom trainings, um, take part of the Narcan trainings. Um, if they're interested in obtaining a Narcan kit, they could always come into one of our um, one of our sites located throughout Western Massachusetts and pick up a kit there. Um, they can just express that they've taken part of the virtual trainings. They'll get, um, they'll go through an impromptu training real quick at the sites and they'll get a kit signed off to them. So we do want to offer them, um, continue offering them virtually. We're trying to figure out what's going to work best for timing for individuals as well. Maybe start offer them during the day, um, during regular business hours and some in the evenings as well. Um, yeah, um, we've also put up Nalox boxes. I don't know if that's up here, but should that's I the next one. If you want to just hold for a sec, we'll, we'll yeah, yeah, I'll hold. on that in a second. Um, and one of the other things that we um, have done collectively as a group is to create a Google tracking sheet because Tapestry is not the only one that's doing Narcan training. And just to understand um, kind of where and how many people have been are being trained across the county um, to see where there's what's the progress that's being made, but also identifying gaps too. Um, so that's one of the other things that we're doing and trying to get folks to fill those fill that in um, as they conduct Narcan trainings out in the community. Um, so I'm going to invite Jade from. Gandara to talk a little bit more about the stigma campaign that you're working on. Awesome. Thanks, Levana. Hello, everyone. So yes, we are working on a bilingual marketing campaign to help eliminate stigma uh, when it comes to mental health, substance use disorder, as well as working kind of hand in hand with um, Tapestry about spreading the word that Narcan saves lives and um, also um, letting people know where they can find out more about getting trained on using Narcan. So we're doing bilingual, so Spanish and English. As you can see here, we did run a radio, a bilingual radio campaign in October 2021, where it would bring people to 413cares.org, uh, or and it was the Seen Stigma or Without Stigma campaign, where people actually can go on the page and find access to whether it was Narcan, mental health, substance use services um, that are available across the area. Uh, the other piece that we're currently working on, you can see the screenshot of my buddy uh, Pedro there, we're working on <laughs> Narcan training videos. So while Tapestry is out doing these trainings on Zoom or a little in person, we also are creating a short, like maybe three to five minute video where people can watch and get an idea of how Narcan is used. And I know, um, you know, uh, Pedro's going to talk a little bit more about the, the locks box and getting people access um, out in the community. Eventually, when those are done, we're going to have a flyer that's next to the, the locks box where people can use a QR code and go directly to the training. So let's say they've never been to a training with Tapestry. They will go on in English or in Spanish 
and they can watch a quick training video so that they understand how to use that Narcan if they haven't had a chance to do that. So um, we're pretty close to launching those um, Narcan training uh, videos. And um, yeah, we've been um, working pretty hard to do that and kind of working in you know, tandem with everyone from the team. And so far, so good. And we hope to have them out soon. Thank, Thank you, you, Jade. <laughs> um, and so one of the other strategies that we've been working on is connected to this. So it um, is harm reduction. Um, and this is where we're doing a lot of work um, and trying to get more Nalox boxes up in, in the Springfield area. Um, and then uh, Isabel from uh, Stoya Key has been doing a bunch of training. So I'm going to hand it back to Pedro first just to update us on the Nalox boxes. And then we'll hear from Isabel. Right. Yeah. So the Nalox boxes, um, as you can see, there's a little image of it here. Um, on the thing, I'm just going to put my screen. Um, and in the box, what you have there is two doses of Narcan, a little handout that kind of explains how to use the Narcan. And in the orange container, there is a breathing mask um, um, to perform um, rescue breathing for individuals that are um, experiencing an, uh, an overdose. Um, so we, what we're trying to do is strategically place these throughout Springfield um, and have them accessible to the general public. So we do a good job at our brick and mortar sites. I know um, New North Citizens Council as well gives out Narcan, Learn to Cope gives out Narcan. Um, but again, during business hours, we do a great job of that. After business hours, our doors are closed. Um, we're not as accessible to some folks. So we want to place these out in the general public where people can have access to that. Um, outside of regular business hours. Um, so finding areas throughout Springfield where they, we've identified some high activity um, and, and strategically placing them outside where people can have access to them. So currently there is two boxes that are up right now. One of them is on School Street, right outside the open door building. One is, the other one is at the Monkey Ridge building on the South End, right on Main Street. Um, I just had a conversation with individuals, with staff at the Community Justice Center on Liberty Street, the old registry, um, motor vehicle registry in Springfield. Um, so they were, they're interested in placing on a lox box outside of their building as well. Um, we've had conversations with um, Valor Recovery Center. They're located right there on Worthington Street, um, towards the bottom of Worthington Street. Um, they're interested in having a box. However, they're Outside of their building, it's all glass. So we're trying to figure out a way to put the boxes up on the glass where it can hold up even through the elements and you know the rain, snow, or whatever the case may be, um, where it can stay up there. Um, we do have we were in conversations with you know uh open door director there, Terry Maxey connected me with um a food pantry in the north end. Um, which would be an ideal spot to kind of have a box up. It's just a matter of following up. We've been playing phone tag for um, quite some time now, um, but he has the box, the Nalox box there. He's already had the conversations. I'm trying to get in touch with the individuals at the food pantry in the North End in order to have the conversation, train them on Narcan um, and answer some of the questions they may have of hosting the box at their sites. So what we're looking for is individuals to host a box. Um, they can just let us know um, whether they own the building or they know the property owners where they can get permission to put the box up outside of the building. Um, and all they have to do is host a box. They can um, inform us once the box is empty or if there's any damage to it, we can come back and refill the boxes with Narcan, with breathing mask, with the inserts, um, and then do any repairs that the boxes might need as well. Thanks, Pedro. Mm -hmm. uh, Isabel, you wanna talk about your trainings and all the work you've done? Yes, so hello everyone. Um, so I have been working on decreasing stigma, prejudice, discrimination of mental health and suicide through uh, La Cultura Sana trainings. And La Cultura Sana means the culture cures, by the way. Um, and the trainings, I would like to specify what I mean by training. It's more of a dialogue, I will say, and it's divided in three parts. The first part we talk about what is mental health? Like what, 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 what does that even mean to them? And then I go into how the psychiatric system defines what we call depression, anxiety, and suicidality, and ask them whether those definitions match what they see in their work. And then the last part, I talk about community care or peer support, what are tools, strategies, things that we can say and ask to people when they are having, let's say, 
you know, a bad day. Some people call it a crisis, but let's say a bad day. Um, and so these, the people who I have been training, I call them the mental health stakeholders, the social, cultural, mental health stakeholders. And so far, I have been able to train 45 people, and that includes hairstylists, herbalists, librarians, and doulas, primarily in the Holyoke and Springfield area. And I have learned a lot, a lot of things. And of course, I don't have enough time to talk about all of them. But the main thing that I have learned is these stakeholders have way more knowledge about mental health than we think. And I, I, I will say the psychiatric mental health system, the traditional systems are missing out uh, on a lot of important data. Um, things like, you know, in mental health, we call them warning signs. Um, these stakeholders know a lot about warning signs that uh, the system might not see or notice because it's not their expertise. So things like the quality of the hair, for instance, uh, the hairstylists, they look at the quality of their hair and they notice, huh, huh, you haven't been taking care of your hair like you used to. What does that mean? Or looking at the fake eyelashes. They look at the quality of the eyelashes and they notice whether they have been crying a lot. OK, like things like that, that maybe a psychiatrist or um, a therapist, traditional psychiatrist, therapist might miss, they notice. Um, and uh, another thing that um, I learned is that these stakeholders, they do know that they are me actually mental health stakeholders. They, t they told me, oh, yeah, we do this work especially hairstylists, the hairstylists that I trained, they were like, yeah, we are psychologists. We are totally psychologists. And so uh, a lot of this, the library institutes, they do know the importance of their work and they do know they're part of that community in mental health. And finally, I will add that I think the most or one of the most important things I learned is that people are reaching out. I know there is this idea that, oh my God, the Latinx, the black people, they're not reaching out. They're not asking for help. They are. They're not necessarily asking for help from the system, but they're asking for help from their people, people who talk like them, who look like them, who are accessible. Most of the services, they do not ask for a fee, like the library, for instance. Um, or if they ask for a fee, it's way lower <laughs> than a therapy session. And most of these also ask for insurance uh, requirements and things like that. And they, they don't have a three month waiting list. So anyhow, I could keep going forever, but um, those are mainly the, the lessons I learned from these stakeholders. And I hope to continue this work for sure. So thank you. Thank you so much, Isabel. And I think it's, I'm just, it's so great to hear you speak about what you've learned and and the information that you're bringing to um, these stakeholders, but also what you've been taking away um, and valuing the the insight that they have about the community and people in the community. So um, I think we need to pay more attention to that um, for sure. So thank you for the, the, the brief update. Two minutes. Okay. So I'm going to apologize in advance for some of the tech study slides. Um, I just have a couple more. And one of the great things, I think this might've been mentioned at the last full chip meeting um, was a NATO grant that we got um, through the CDC and it's with their IOPSL program, which means uh, implementing overdose prevention strategies at the local level. Um, and so this Magda Cologne um, was really instrumental in putting this forward and bringing this to our team's attention. And it really is um, building off of the work that our community team has been doing and able to put more resources into this work. Um, so we're really excited about that. And it's it's going to be a lot. So we, our contract took a lot longer than we thought to get signed um, and finalized, but we now have it as of earlier this month. 
Um, and it's an, for an 18 month project, $500,000. And we're working with Quebec Hill Substance Use Alliance, Gondora, Mercy Medical Center, um, DART, and then uh, under the Northampton Health Department. And we have a couple trainers we're working with, um, Choice Recovery Coach Inc. And um, we're going to be doing a couple trainings with Hanair and Hernandez. So just really quickly, um, some of the, the five objectives we have are reducing stigma um, and doing a lot more um, expanding the media campaigns. Um, God, and Jade are, is working on that. And then Quebec Hills um, is also going to be doing a media campaign that really speaks to the small towns in their region. Um, uh, increasing awareness of substance use disorder resources and harm reduction tools in the ED. Um, Mercy is working on that and incorporating the recovery coaches, um, behavioral health specialists, and um, using harm reduction carts to really make sure that um, patients coming in to the ED have um, people who are aware and tools at their disposal that they can walk away with. Increasing access to Narcan. Um, Quebec Hills is going to be doing a lot of Narcan trainings and training peers in the community to be Narcan trainers. So that's exciting. Increasing collaboration of recovery coaches and providers, um, bringing more of those um, people together. Um, and DART is doing a lot. They, they'll have a Hamden County, a coordinator for Hamden County. Um, to be able to do more work and support um, some of the needs in Hampton County. And then improving a data infrastructure um, uh, to better understand overdose trends and coordinate an effective response and outreach and DART is leading that. Do any of the partners working on this wanna say one or two words more or something that I missed? I can't see the chat right now, so. Um, if someone wants to help me out there. I got an eye on it. Okay, thanks. Okay, and then um, we we're just talking about how our group is really work, trying to work to improve health equity. Um, and I'm not gonna go through every one of these. Um, it's a lot of text, I apologize. Um, but I think with uh, what's exciting with the NATO grant is it's really bringing together um, the different parts of our of Hamden County, um, both rural and urban, and making sure the unique needs across the county are trying to be met um, and the gaps trying to be filled with with those funds. Um, really making sure that um, we are uplifting voices of black black and Latinx people who've been disproportionately impacted by substance use um, and making sure that they have access to harm reduction um, materials. Um, and then I think like Isabel was saying, bringing that authentic dialogue about mental health to places in the community that people really overlook um, is incredibly important and that they have the tools and knowledge that they need um, to support the community members that they are serving is really important. So that's a little bit about the work that we're doing. Um, does anyone from my group want to add anything else? Okay, I'm going to stop share so I can see all you in the chat. Okay. Any questions from folks? Like Liz, Liz, do you have your hand up? Okay. <laughs> I think we might need to move on, Levana, because we've got okay. two groups. Yep. So we'll move on to community team four. Okay. Liz, you want to start us off? And again, these are text heavy slides, I hope. Um, but we'll we'll send them out after if you don't cover everything. <laughs> So I'll start and I'll ask, um, unless you have asked them separately, I'll ask Ellery and Zoe to feel free to jump in. Uh, we really focused on training service providers 
on how to talk service providers and what we think of as informal um, outreach folks on how to talk to folks about HIP. Uh, HIP was piloted at GTC and grew out of work that uh, our colleague, some of us still remember very fondly, Franco Martinez Notito, who was an employee of DTA, but embedded in the Food Policy Council and helped to design. And over the years, we have been really core advocates around this work with CISA and others from across the state, moving it from a local Feeney grant to this broader statewide initiative that has been funded for the last several years through the state legislature. Um, and this is the first year that we have put forward a bill um, sponsored by Senator Gobi um, to move HIP into permanent legislation. And for those who don't know, it's primarily a tool for families who are on SNAP or what most people refer to as food stamps in the Latino community, Los Cupones, uh, about HIP. Despite it being um, created, and I'm sorry, I should have said it was also piloted through the Holyoke Food and Fitness um, effort in Holyoke. And, but we have some of the lowest usage in the state. It's funded this year at $13 million and in Springfield, we use less than 1% of what's available. So it was really important for us to figure out how do we talk to more people? And we recognize that just our one-on-one, -on -one, our being primarily the Springfield Food Policy Council, guarding the community, Wellspring, um, I'm sorry, the Go Fresh Mobile Market, which has been held for years by the Public Health Institute of Western Mass and Wellspring is managing it this year. We're all talking about it and not reaching enough people. So we thought that talking to people who talk to people would be the way to go. And our efforts have all been spent on that. Um, last year, our TerraCore associate worked with CISA's TerraCore associates and they came up with a cute little video. We replicated that video this year and we've been using that to reach other resident advocates that are attached to organizations, our own resident advocates, and lots of community health workers, including frontline staff at Square One, at um, New Beginnings, and I'm having a mental block, but the newest early learning center led by Nikki, it'll come to me in a minute. Um, it's right next door to Brookings Elementary School. We've also trained all of the parent um, liaisons in the Mason Square and the East Springfield schools. This is a picture of a resident who learned about HIP and then decided she wanted a backyard garden, which we put in for her, um, we being the Food Policy Council, and she used her HIP benefit to buy seedlings. So there's, there's a little bit of, obviously, nepotism in that. I serve on the board of GTC um, and I help build the garden boxes. But it's thrilling that people are not just buying the produce that they need every week. She's a regular customer of the farm store, but they're also buying produce so they can grow themselves. And I'm really proud to say that GTC, who does an annual plant sale every year, this year had almost $5,700 in seedling sales to HIP customers. They can only buy food seedlings. So for me, it's just evidence that we can build either an alternative, um, alternatives to the food system or, or really expand how we think about what the food system is. I live in the real world some of the time and I recognize that she's not gonna grow all the food that she needs, but she is growing a lot of food that she needs. And what we're seeing is that people on average, 80% of them report sharing the food that they grow with their neighbors. So anecdotally, we've had people say, I never spoke to my neighbor before, but then she commented on my cherry tomatoes and I gave her some, and now we're friends. Like really powerful community building stuff. Um, and to give you a sense of reference, last year we sold $760 in seedling sales. So it's huge. And this outreach is due in very large part to the work that Ellery at CISA does and to our TerraCore member who's with us this year, MM. TerraCore is an AmeriCorps program really focused on soil um, and food and growing. And so these young people come and um, just do amazing work. 
Our residents also have been very engaged this year. Resident advocates, um, they're coming up with another name for themselves because they don't like that one. But they have learned how to talk to policymakers, to legislators, representatives, and senators about how important HIP is to them, both in accessing healthy food, but also in extending their SNAP budget so that they've been able to buy more protein. And they talk about being able to buy eggs um, instead of having to spend their money on canned produce at the grocery store or even expensive produce at the grocery store. What we're trying to track now is both the cost savings to folks as well as the access because everybody who is shopping in any kind of way see how lean things are in the supermarket and how expensive it's gotten. We worked with the broader team to develop postcards, which we thought were incredibly wonderful, but learned over the course of the last probably six to eight months that they were too text heavy and didn't use words that made HIP accessible. So now we're creating flyers in Spanish and English that talk more about the benefit being free, um, resulting in free produce. And the GTC and the Food Policy Council were able to partner because the Food Policy Council gets meat donations from an organic meat producer. And we use that meat to sort of as a carrot. We reached out to families who we knew were struggling through our parent facilitators at the elementary school and said, come shop at the GTC food store and learn how to use your HIP benefit and get 20 pounds of free meat. Um, and we were overrun. And um, most importantly, we have seen folks coming back. So this year we're really focused on engaging those repeat customers to become ambassadors, particularly in the Southeast Asian and Latinx community. Um, Outreach in the Southeast Asian community has been particularly difficult. They're very visible, especially in Mason Square, but the language barriers are huge. So for those of you who are working in other domains, um, particularly young people, if you have people who are multilingual and can speak either French or some of the Asian dialects, I would be thrilled to hire them to come and help us spread the word about him. Is this me too or someone else, Becky? Um, thanks, Liz. This is going to be. I think it's me. Uh, Anna, yeah. It's, hi, everybody. It's Anna uh, from Holyo Health Center. I'm the coordinator of the Let's Move Hamden County 510 program, which is a healthy lifestyle program. And um, it used to be known as Let's Move Holyo 510. And I'm going to be doing this presentation, and I hope Maritza Traperino and Liz. Uh, somebody else that I'm missing that is part of the group, please feel free to join. And our strategy to work was the farmer market coach. I think the name of the strategy is really self-explanatory, but I just want to say that the farmer market coach started many years ago after we heard from the community that the farmer market was something that the community was afraid to use. They were unfamiliar with the farmer market systems. They were unfamiliar that they could redeem the EBT cars. They didn't know how to use it. They express a lot of fear and stigma about the farmer markets. And after that, we at the health center through a particular project at the time led by Dr. Binivix and Healthy Weight Clinic, we decide to hand to hand educate the community where they were at the farmer market. And we at the time was granted with a mini grant that helped us to provide farmer market vouchers for those families who were part of the Healthy Weight Clinic. And we saw that even giving a free money to patient wasn't enough for them to feel comfortable to use the farmer market. And I work as a community educator at the Holio Health Center and had a conversation with Dr. Biggs and the Healthy Weight Clinic and we decide to create 
a new role under my community education role, who was be present at the farmer my market and here and be the company person to the patients at the farmer market that quote hand to hand bring them and encourage them to try new vegetables and to teach them how to navigate the difficult farmer market system. And I want to highlight the difficult because something that is pretty easy for all of us, it wasn't easy for the community. At the same time, we noticed that the HIP program wasn't used in Holyoke. And we were wondering, we have a HIP approved vendors, few, but we had it. And we didn't really have people using it. And we start combining the farmer market education for healthy eating with the SNAP use. And we try to do it in a bilingual way. We try to do it in a very simple way by asking people, do you have ABT? Let's go to the farmer market together. I meet you at the farmer market. We will go and and start from there. And we start seeing people actually using it. And we have been doing this for a while until now that I will say with a lot of proud that the farmer market coach is being not only recognized, but highlight as one of the programs who really help families to improve access to fresh products. I just give you a little bit of the background because all of that work has ended in our ability to leverage a lot of funds now, mini grants, but are huge amount of money for us because we don't need a lot of money. We need is a lot of people working with us on this campaign and spreading the word. And that is part of what this uh, strategy has become very successful. In this time, uh, with the help of the chief and Liz and many others, we were leveraged funds from um, from the chief himself, from Project Bread, and from Fallon Health, and from the Charles Edge Foundation to continue the farmer market coach during this spring and the summer and the fall markets. Um, we work very closely with the Chamber of Commerce in Holyoke and with our uh, farmer market manager. We create a bilingual farmer market oriented uh, training and we were able to train other agencies on how to become a farmer market. We were able to actually work with CISA and with Liz actually um, having many conversations that uh, include uh, the Springfield Policy Council experiencing learnings and the gardening of the community learnings of what the families are in need to be able to feel empowered to use the SNAP and the HIP benefits at the farmer market. We were also able to secure funds for the first time a permanent staff of the farmer market uh, who was not only bilingual but cultural sensitive for the farmer market in Kohl. We trained this person in the LESMO Poly 510, which is five fruit and vegetables a day, two or less uh, hour of screen time, one hour of physical activity, and zero sugary drinks. And Excuse me, that Anna. is the yeah. Two minutes, just two minutes. Okay. Two minute warning. Yeah, we were able to, uh, during the winter, engage 100 people, uh, spoke with 20 uh, uh, people about the HIP and the use. We were able to redeem $1,400 uh, in vouchers that were actually used at the farmer market. And we were able now to apply for uh, grants that we are waiting to hear back. And at this farmer market, we were also able to partner with 413, um, 413 uh, Fitness to provide fitness at the farmer market. And you see that the families come together and they actually dance together. We were also uh, able to talk with a representative 
Pat Duffy, and we are going to be meeting with uh, her this coming Friday. And the idea is to support permanent funding in the state budget. And we are looking to focus in community that has the higher rate of food insecurity because we see this program as a way to increase access and in those communities that are historically marginalized or known as a blue desert. And this is a great program that has shown uh, also that uh, improved the heat and the snack use. And we really want to encourage everybody to kind of go to our website and learn and be part of the SNAP and HIP education program. Thank you, Anna. Thank you, Anna. I, we had one more strategy, but um, I think in the interest of time, we can hold off on that. But it's basically um, improving farmers market sustainability. Um, so I, I think we have to move on. Sorry, Ellery. Um, but we will send that these out with the slides. And we just had some maps. <laughs> so let me just... Um, you can read it later. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Sorry, sorry, back you. <laughs> we always need more time. Yeah. Um, oh. uh, to, any questions for Community Team 4? Thank you, Liz and Anna, for sharing some of your wonderful work. Okay. I'm going to hand it over to Tiffany for Community Team 5. There's Tiffany. Okay. I'm just getting presentation pulled up. Okay. Okay. Assuming everyone can see my screen. Um, again, Tiffany Rufino, I'm with the Public Health Institute of Mass. And I work with the Violence and Injury Prevention Team, Community Team 5. And um, we're collectively going to just share a little bit about um, the, prog the progression of Community Team 5, some of the things we worked on in year one, and um, that have sort of flowed into our strategies for year two. And Eddie, if you want to share a little bit about this picture, all throughout our presentation, we have some photos of mentor relationships. Um, so we'll just share a very quick story um, to, so you know who's looking at you in the screen here um, and share the agenda. Okay, no, just going over the agenda, the things we're going to talk about is we're going to do a year one overview year two strategies, um, progress towards strategies, and then we're going to close with some, we'll save some time for some questions and answers. But um, no, I just wanted to say that, and I'll talk a little bit more about this as the slides go on, that we've been very intentional trying to get youth connected to additional caring adults. Um, and I'll talk a little bit more about that as we move on. So... Uh, Milani, did you want to share about this slide? Sure. So this year we have had some accomplishments, Ashley. Um, so among us, we have launched a mentoring campaign. Um, we're able to launch a uh, launch a 413care.org mentoring page. So where programs can go and enter their information and basically find ways to support, um, to, to recruit volunteers. So some trainings were provided in that regard so that programs could go and understand what, how exactly um, they can sign up and have their organizations be part of these. Um, we sponsored four mentor, uh, mentoring matches through um, Big Brothers Big Sisters, and in terms of um, the work that Mass Mentoring Partnership has done, we offer training, advocacy, and empowering youth adult relationships, mentoring summit. Uh, we were also, a, we had a legislative breakfast and 
and advocacy training. So those are sort of like a big high highlights. Thank you, Milani. And the the um the ad that you see on the top of the screen is part of the the mentoring campaign that was created last year. Um, in collaboration with um, many different partners, sort of shown there. And so now we're gonna move into talking about the strategies that we focused on for this year too. Um, and we realized as we're developing um, our strategies or as we're developing this presentation that our strategies, um, while they did not necessarily disrupt structural racism, um, they did improve equity and begin to break down some of the uh, barriers that we're facing in our communities as it relates to mentoring. And so just wanted to sort of um, paint that picture, let you all know ahead of time that we're sort of, we are working towards um, disrupting racism in, in these strategies. And our first strategy was to increase youth mentoring opportunities in Hamden County by increasing, increasing awareness of the positive impact of all mentor relationships, inclusive of formal and informal uh, mentoring. So to do this, um, we were to host, a, host or participate in a community mentorship awareness event seeking culturally responsive and non-formal non mentors, um, collaborate with the Youth Mental Health Coalition, uh, to offer a mentorship event connecting youth to mentors and youth serving organizations and to strategically promote the mentor campaign again this year, focusing on inner city media streams within Hamden County and also um, running the ad more than once last year. We were able to create the ads and push them out. Um, this year, we're hoping to push them out a, couple, a few times throughout the year to just keep folks reminded about mentoring and reminded about the 413cares.org um, resource. So how does this uh, strategy improve equity and address components of structural racism? It focuses on community engagement with the Hamden County residents to inform our strategies and aim to recruit mentors with lived experiences, creating stronger and lasting matches. It provides opportunities for mentors who may not be considered mentors in formal mentoring settings, and it dismantles silos and uh, works collaboratively, collaboratively with other county and state initiatives to share and uplift resources. And so now I'll pass it um, back to Eddie and then also to Dave to just share about um, some of the ways that their organization, um, they've been working on increasing mentoring opportunities. Yeah, so no, I wanna start with saying that um, many of the agencies working with the Domain 5 team are actually using intentional recruiting, targeting folks with live experience that look like the youth we serve and also that have grown up in the same type neighborhoods as the youth we serve. Um, through our mentoring program here at the Sheriff's Department, we bring in mentors to actually talk to the inmates here in our facility, and that actually leads to getting other mentors. Like there was a guy that I worked with here at the Sheriff's Department. He ends up getting released. Now he's coming up, he's coming back in to be a mentor to some of the inmates here. And then what that does, it continues to allow, you know, especially people with lived experience to be able to put themselves in positions of being a mentor. So they learn how to do it while they're here. And then when they get out, they can get out there and do it there as well. I'll turn it back to you, Tiffany. Thank you. And David, did you want to share a little bit about brother, Big Brothers, Big Sisters? Sure. Yeah. Um, you know, and I just want to, you know, share and piggyback on what Ed is saying a little bit. You know, one of the things, especially for a formalized mentoring program like Big Brothers, Big Sisters, for years and years and years, we had prided ourselves on the fact that there was this, um, you know, uh, structured intake process that in our minds allowed for safe uh, matches for children in the community. Uh, and it did absolutely eliminate uh, a large population 
population of people who may or may not have been a good mentor at the time. Uh, and one of the things that we've been doing, not just here in Hammond County, but across the country for Big Brothers Big Sisters, is really looking at our systems and figuring out a way to be more inclusive. Uh, Eddie talked a little bit about what they do at the Sheriff's Department. But within Big Brothers Big Sisters, um, you know, really looking at shared experiences, life experiences, figuring out what's appropriate, what's a safety risk, what's not. And there's been a lot of education around who is appropriate for um, mentoring and which is why one of the focuses on Community Team 5 is we've also talked a lot about sort of these informal mentoring relationships, me being that uh, formalized mentoring organizations such as myself can't match all the children in Springfield alone, never mind Hamden County, with uh, fulfilling the need that they have. And so we've really worked to try to educate folks uh, out in the community, one, around the fact that pretty much uh, anybody can be a mentor. There are programs out there, whether it be a formal or informal program that uh, is available for people to get involved, but also educate the parents and guardians out there letting them know that it's not a one size fits all, that there's a lot of opportunities. And we'll talk a little bit about that again for one of our other strategies um, in terms of being able to get that word out. But a lot of that time and energy has been spent on, on educating people. Thank you, David. And then I also wanted to just pass it to um, Dirk, if you wanted to share a little bit about the therapeutic mentoring at, at BHN and you know how, um, you expressed that you're kind of building from the bottom up as far as um, mentoring goes. Yes, of course. Thank you, Tiffany, for that. Yes, building from the bottom up is <clears throat> is something that I've been uh, talking about for a while within BHN. I'm really excited to, you know, we have multiple ways that we're building from the bottom up. Uh, first way is that we have mentors, especially we're definitely borrowing this from Eddie, we're really looking at the experience of mentors rather than um, what their degree is. Um, at BHN, I take people with, you know, GEDs um, to bachelor's level uh, staff. So definitely we're looking at the experience the staff have as well, too. That lets us um, take in mentors and build from the bottom up. Um, we've also partnered with um, HCC, Holyoke Community College, um, just to also get CHWs in, apprentices, that we are teaching um, the ways of therapeutic mentor for an entire year. And then we're actually bringing them on to hire them. So that has been um, excellent. Um, that has been wonderful to partner with HCC. So just want to give a personal thank you to them. Um, as well as we've started to build new programs at the Behavioral Health Network um, that incorporate mentors. For example, the first thing that we were successful in doing is we now have crisis mentors. Um, so if you're calling BHN, crisis, um, maybe a mentor will be able to talk to you about some coping skills and talk you down um, from certain things such as, you know, um, suicide prevention, um, you know, mood stabilization. And we do a lot of those things as well, too. So successful. We have crisis mentors. We're still building that up at BHN. Um, so just really happy to add that service, as well as what we're doing um, in the future is we want to build up young adult peer mentors. Um, as well, too, to just really borrow off of that experience, you know, I'm um, really honing in on that experience um, in the community and just experience with mental health services and just community services, really trying to build that up with young adult peer mentors. So I'm really excited about that. I know um, when we had a mentoring presentation, um, I used one of my TMs who had lived experience. Her name was Genesis. And, you know, we're looking for her to actually um, really be a part of building that program and being a supervisor for that program, which leads me into my last point, is that we are creating um, positions within therapeutic mentor, within crisis mentor, within young adult peer mentor to um, put mentors in leadership positions so that in the future they can become supervisors, they can be encouraged um, to go back to school um, as well too. But uh, no, no going back to school needed to be a leader in um, the BHN mentor program at this point in time. So um, that's what building up from the ground up means. And, you know, thank you for giving me that um, time to talk about that, Tiffany. Yes, for sure. Thank you so much. Um, I think that's awesome work um, and a great strategy for, for getting more 
mentors in with lived experience. So that's awesome. Um, and I got to keep the time for us too. Okay, we've got about three more three more minutes left. Um, so moving right along, our second strategy was to recruit additional youth serving organizations in Hamden County to join the 413cares.org online community and to promote and grow, um, show them how to promote and grow their mentorship programs with 413cares and engage with the community via referrals um, while simultaneously educating the community on how to use the resource. Um, and so we do this, um, or, oh, I have a mistake there on my slide, but again, we were doing this by really trying to recruit additional organizations to get onto 413 Cares and also offering a sort of step-by-step -step process for how to, showing them how to put their, how to get their programs onto 413 Cares and how to, and how to use it. I think um, it is a user-friendly platform and once we can get folks to, to get on there and see how easy it is to use, then we'll be able to grow it a little bit more um, and make sure that we have lots of opportunities listed there um, for Hamden County. And then also to spread awareness through the mentor campaign, to circle back and make sure that we are pushing out um, the mentoring campaign and driving people, families, community to 413 Cares for resources. And then, so how does this uh, strategy address components of structural racism and improve, improve equity? Um, it provides a user-friendly way for Hamden County communities to learn about and access mentorship programs. Timer, two minutes. Um, the free platform allows informal and formal, program, formal programs to utilize the referral and data collection resources and also educating the community and families on how to use this community resource. And um, David, I know you had some more that you that you wanted to share about just some of the things that you're hearing from the families you work with. Um, sure, yeah, and be conscious of people's time, obviously. But, you know, one of the big things, even prior to COVID, but certainly now is um, really accessing, and one of our colleagues earlier spoke in their presentation about um, not that people aren't asking, but it's who they're asking. Well, the other thing that we're seeing is um, where to go for this information. And, you know, as a longstanding organization, we want to make sure that even if we're not involved in this youth's life and this family um, for the next 20 years or so, the chances are we're, we're gonna be gone at some point in time. And we really wanna to try to raise up our families and make sure that they have the resources, they have the knowledge and the opportunities to be able to self-sustain themselves. So really circling around this 413 Cares, trying to bring the network together of formal and informal mentoring programs, um, you know, some of the work, some of these slides here that you're seeing pictures, a lot of them are matches in our program that really came through with the work that uh, we've been able to do with Ed and the, um, the folks in Holyoke. Um, those are all, except for this match here, are all Holyoke based matches. Um, there's a story behind each one of them, of course. And then you have situations that Dirk just shared with you, you know, collaborating, right? So, um, you know, in a lot of ways, the program that Dirk is running is could be Big Brothers Big Sisters could be like a step down for um, a long term relationship when those therapeutic mentors are done. So, you know, really, it's all about educating. We're really trying to pick away and be grassroots and get to that foundation of the systematic racism and really trying to raise people up educate them, but provide them those opportunities. Uh, that's really what it's been about. And, and just really trying to make sure that there are no gaps, making sure that these children and the families aren't falling through those gaps, because uh, that's the most important thing. Absolutely. Thank you, David. Sure. And then our progress so far, uh, we did host the 413 CARES training for mentoring and serving organizations. Um, we did participate with the Youth Mental Health Coalition. Um, the youth, Springfield Youth Vax Force hosted an event, Healthy Us Day of Wellness. Um, and we had um, a few folks come out, BHN came out um, to provide some information. We also had the Impact Center, Gandra's Impact Center, come out to share resources with youth. Um, 
And uh, we also had Follow My Steps who joined us to uh, talk with youth about their programming and get folks signed up. So we were able to engage a little bit with the community, which was really great. Um, and so we will be relaunching the Mentor King campaign, um, aiming to have it air in the summer, fall, and winter of this year. And then some of our, our growth opportunities, we realize, um, right, there, there's always room for growth. Um, recruitment, we really want to make sure that we're able to um, get additional folks on our community team from, you know, representative of some of these um, groups that I listed here, parents and caregivers, folks from faith-based organizations, and um, additional youth-serving organizations to, to join the meetings and inform some of our strategy and implementation. And then also to continue inspiring connection um, to 413 CARES. I've heard in this meeting and actually a couple of other meetings this week that I've been in around information and um, the community just being in more of an acute state and needing to find resources. And so um, can't express enough how important it is for us to continue to connect folks to resources and really see 413 Cares as an opportunity to be able to do that. And that concludes our presentation. We're happy to take a few questions and you all have them. Stop sharing. Well, thank you, Tiffany and Community Team 5 for sharing your great information. Um, thank you. It just, it's so, as someone who's newer to the CHIP network, it's really great to hear the presentations and really learn more about what's been going on. And, and there's such, there's so many threads that I think bring all the work that we're doing together um, to have this larger collective impact. So I, I just appreciated hearing everyone and making a lot of connections and um, just appreciating all the work everyone's been doing. Um, Becky, I think we're gonna, th are we gonna take a break now? We're about. Yeah, we're, um, over. I just wanna check in with everyone. So we, we scheduled this meeting until 1230 so we could do some breakout rooms. And I just wanna make sure folks are okay with that. Um, and if so, We'll, we'll do a quick break and then come back and, and get into breakout rooms. Okay. Um, and I want, I also wanted to um, launch a poll before you run, take a break or when you come back. Um, and this will just sort of get us to start thinking about um, what we'll be talking about. So the question is, what's the most useful, uh, what is most useful about the Hampton Chip chip work and you can check, I believe you can pick more than one of these. And Becky, how long is our break? Uh, we'll take a five minute break and we'll just do a little bit shorter breakout rooms. So, so we'll be back um, at 1150? Yeah. Okay. So if everyone could answer the poll and then we'll resume at 1150. Okay. Becky, I noticed some people are leaving at noon just before they go. What I should have led with is 
all of the work that the Food Policy Council GTC did um, with all of our partners here, including Benjamin from the city and Miss B from Wayfinders and um, that we wouldn't have been able to do it, but for the way that PVPC was willing to reorganize the funding and create these funding opportunities for the organizations. We would have still been trying to do the work, but we wouldn't have been able to do the volume of outreach. And um, and I'm just going to keep saying thank you as long as I can, because it then caused us to think about how we work within our own um, organizations and with other organizations. Square One and the Food Policy Council are leading um, one of four statewide mass up initiatives, and it's all focused on HIP and even pre preceding HIP racial equity. So we do all of our work through a racial equity lens. We started our work asking ourselves, when did you first learn about race and when did you first realize it mattered? And that has steered our work. And that really came out of our interrupting ourselves here in the chip um, under your leadership. And so I just think it's really important to lift out that sometimes it takes walking through fear um, on a funder's part or a leader's part and being willing to share in resources that really does strengthen the whole because it's, from my vantage point, really amazing to see all this different work and how much of it is being driven by the people most impacted by it. That is quite different than the way we did CHIP work three or four or five years ago. Um, and so uh, Becky deserves a huge round of applause for that for um, pushing through even when it was uncomfortable and for bringing the rest of us along with, with her. And uh, you should all pat yourselves on the back as well because talking about race and living in that space is not easy. It's uncomfortable. And sometimes it's not just white people, but it's people of color who have to check our own selves. So I feel like a much better organizational convener as a result of this work specifically. So it's, I'm just saying thank you again to Becky and to all of you um, for all the hard work that you're doing. Thank you, Liz. I think people are on break, so hopefully, hopefully but you are recording. <laughs> I listen, I love hearing you, Liz, I miss you. I miss you too. But it's warm now and we'll see each other and I'll just, cook large pots of greens and invite you to my house if I yeah, don't see do you, you enough. <laughs> do you eat eggs? Oh, tons of eggs. Um, why are you raising hens? I have chickens. Oh, wait, this is being recorded. That's I don't okay. know what city you live in, but in my city, it's not allowed. I'm well, a rebel, rebel chicken farmer. I am. I'm about to be. I'm building a coop as we speak. <laughs> yeah, I have five chickens. Yes, Tiffany, yeah. you'll have a goat soon, whether you want it or not. <laughs> I had a I had a little lamb last year. You know, we may be sharing more with each other than we should. I hope there's no undercover spies. <laughs> I'm, I'm not worried about it. I'm Me either. Worried. We'll just set your chickens on them. Exactly, and they're they're I mean they're wonderful. I love them. They so are. Much. They're really good for us, and we are going to the Food Policy Council is organizing itself to officially relaunch its campaign around hens. We want people to be able to be legal, and mm -hmm. the majority of hen owners in Springfield are more affluent white people. Just FYI, um, wow. all over in the sixteen acres area, everybody with big tall fences got a lot of chickens running around behind them. Wow. I had a goat, but only for two days before I got caught. Oh, no. <laughs> I'm thrilled you have chicken, Sasha. And I'm yeah, thrilled you your own local eggs. Yeah, and I, literally, I mean, I just, I, they, get, they give me so many. I'm just like constantly looking for new ways. Well, I'll to come like, pick them up because all my yeah. eggs need eggs. I know plenty of people who could put eggs to good use. That's great. Well, I will definitely save you some. I just gave, I gave 14 away this morning and still have 18. Nice. You have happy hens. <laughs> they are, I, I get five, like anywhere between five and eight eggs a day. Wow. And they're delicious. I can vouch for them. <laughs> yes. <laughs> As a matter of fact, I'll come and get some eggs. I know where you live now. <laughs> yep. 
<laughs> oh, excuse me, excuse me, Brenda. Bring me some. <laughs> I shall. <laughs> Please. Becky, Thank this you. is going to derail soon. You better okay. call grab us back. <laughs> uh, maybe maybe the up. most useful thing about Hamden chip work is the food connections being made. That wasn't one in the poll, but it, next time it should be in the other. Opportunities for shared food and shared meals. Yeah, this... Um, this brings up, um, and thank you for reminding me, um, there, we're doing a membership survey, I think I mentioned earlier. Um, I will put it in the chat, um, and we'll also put it in afterwards. But we're hoping that everyone fills this out and add, you know, if there's anything missing, add what, what it is that you have drawn from the chip. Um, so... Um, but we are going to get into community or breakout rooms. A um, few people have left, so I'm, I've decreased the number of rooms to four. Um, and I'm just gonna, you wanna introduce the breakout rooms, Tiffany? Here's the, that's the jam board. Um, let me pull up the screen. Okay. Stop sharing that. Okay. Too many things open right now. <laughs> okay. Here's the questions. Okay. Yeah. So we're gonna go into breakout rooms for how long, Becky? Um, I think just 15 minutes. For yeah. about minutes or so and we're hoping that you all can re can reflect on these three questions um just around what has worked well what could be better and what changes you would like to see and how the chip network works going forward so we're really just trying to get an understanding from you all about you know the pros and cons of the chip i think back when it first started which predates my time um with with ph PHI, um, but before it, when it got started, there weren't as many um, coalitions and networking groups that were getting together and meeting and collaborating. And so with that in mind that there are many groups um, sort of gathering now, we just wanna make sure that we are still fulfilling a need and highlighting um, the work that others are doing and making sure that CHIP is, um, the community health improvement plan is situated to, to include and uplift the work that's happening. So Livana just put the questions in the chat there. And Becky has put us in breakout rooms and we'll see you back here soon. Should we put the Jamboard link in the chat too? Yeah. Yes. Do you have that? We'll be I don't have it up right now. I do. What was that, Liz? I don't have the Jamboard link. Okay, I'll put it, I'll, put put it, it in. I'll broadcast it to all the rooms. Thanks. if that link showed up. Um, so those of you who are on, let's see. Um, oh, okay. I will assign you to some rooms. Anna, are you on? Hi. Um you see a room open up for you? Marlene, are you still on? 
Yes, sorry. I saw it and then it went away. Oh, okay. Um, you should be you should be able to join. Let's see. It's room four. You should see a button to join the room. Okay. Mocha is Mocha is really forgetting my duties for the day. Um, yeah. So our um, actually, Becky, if you want to start us off, okay. Um, yeah. So we had four breakout rooms. Um, who was in room one? I'm gonna have to look again. Do you guys all? Uh, you remember what room you were in and was everyone able to access the jam board? Becky, our team didn't access the jam board. Okay. Super well. So I just took traditional notes and can send that to you. Okay. Um, I have room one. Who's, who was in room one? Is that us? No. There's two. I'll share the screen and maybe it'll, you'll remember. Does anyone recognize that? <laughs> we can also open it to general discussion if you would rather. Um, I think Becky was oh, that? General. Oh, Okay, that was I was gonna say, I don't know if, I, I don't know that I knew we had a room number. Okay. Yeah, we had room one. But okay. we were unable to write room one because somebody else wrote in room one. Oh, okay. oh, so that might have so been that's a... who that is. Whoever that is, <laughs> that's their comment. Guilty, guilty. <laughs> so, yeah, maybe we should just um, share out what are, what are some things folks wrote on the jam board, if you wouldn't mind just unmuting. Brittany, I see you raised your hand. Yeah, I can just share from our group. So a lot of our conversations about what has worked well had to do with um, we uh, Becky asked specifically around like the funding that we're able to access as a collaborative and folks felt like that is something that worked well because it allowed the shift from talking about ideas to actually putting action behind them, um, especially um, for the groups that are working with food access. Um, same thing with community team too with like the nature grant and being able to leverage funds as a collaborative it feels just like more of a possibility to do um and they really appreciated i quoted you sharon um, networking that allows for collaborative projects to take off so networking not just for the sake of like oh that's nice information thank you for sharing but um she feels like it really allows for the um, creativity to like flow in terms of collaboration. Thank you, Brittany. Did anyone else want to share from any of the other groups? Our group also talked about um, in terms of what's working well, the, the meetings from community team meetings to the full chip meetings and even the design team meetings because of that networking that Brittany um, had talked about um, and the feeling that everyone has a floor to speak on um, and that voices can be heard. Um, and that felt important. Uh, and just the opportunity for more community building um, and awareness to help enhance the quality of life in our communities. I would echo Liv, um, some real tangible things that happened out of our domain, working so closely in this domain enabled us, I think, to build from Springfield's vantage point, stronger relationships with Holyoke, who we had worked with, I've known Anna for years, but we got really intentional um, this year and, Every time I was in a meeting with Anna or Marissa, I just learned so much. And then JR, who is the farmer's market manager in Holyoke, 
was able to help um, us to inform and present in the, a broader urban ag, a statewide urban ag network. He talked about being a farmer's market manager and the kinds of outreach that's needed in the community. And there were folks there who aren't going to ever have a farmer's market, but who took away, oh, wow, it's not weird to go stand in front of a building and talk to people um, to get them to come in. So I think that kind of cross-sharing was great. I wish we had more of this across the what we now call community teams uh, in real time. I wish that I know we all go to too many meetings, but I would have loved to. Well, now I know. But so those of you who did all this amazing photo voice work, I'm going to figure out we don't need to reinvent the wheel. We know some photo voice um, work and I've done some work with Alain years ago. And so we have some experience, but GTC and the Food Policy Council is going to be doing youth photo voice and what your youth were able to articulate um, that left me taking things away was profound. So why would I hire another adult consultant? I would rather hire these experienced leaders to come and talk to leaders their own age about how to do this work. So the more opportunities we have for that kind of sharing, I think is really cool. Thank you, Liv and Liz. Was there anyone, anyone else that would like to share? I don't want to jump over somebody else, but in terms of what could, um, what changes we'd like to see, um, we had some discussion about just more community engagement, um, uh, which might require different meeting times or maybe more time to be devoted um, to meetings, um, but it, we're creating opportunities for uh, communities to meet and, and community members to come in um, to that process more and, and creating a comfortable environment for them. Um, I'm just looking through my notes, sorry. <laughs> and Brenda or Anna or brother, I'll jump in too if I'm missing anything. Um, and I think like, you know, being, setting the priority is really listening to community and not other people's agendas necessarily that is set forth by organizations or programs or um, academia, um, but really listening to community first and foremost. And that's one of the challenges too, I wanna add, is how do we engage other community members outside of who's at the table into this process. I just had a, a aha, um, but I know it's just something food for thought. If we possibly could do community listening sessions outside of the Chennai process, if this could be something that is ongoing, but I know that takes capacity, but just to put it out there. Yeah, an interesting idea, Brenda. Uh, thanks, Brenda, for sharing. Um, we know that capacity building is it has to do an, a collaborative, a lot of individuals and community to enhance the quality of life in our community. It takes a lot of people at the table and the people of color to be at the table to make these honest decisions about changes within these communities. We know that partnership fueled by commitment, vision, and, and, and passion takes a lot of organizations to come to the table to make this change. So it's very important that we reach outside our, our box and into the community so that we can get some real value, some real answers and results. So we need to do a, think about that. Thank you. You know, I also feel that um, echo what Brenda said. I think the chief and the I think the chief group has particularly opened the communication channel outside of our own organization. That sometimes is really hard, and I think using um, 
that channel opportunity to really share what is happening in our community is reciprocal. How do you say that? Reciprocal well, to both communities because a lot of the times, for example, in Holyoke, we feel like we have left outside of the conversation. And for many, many years, we feel like we don't work together. And I think this opportunity has been us closer and together. But I think more importantly is like we feel like one community as a whole is our communities who are really similar. And Liz and I, we have shared this in many different groups that even though we applied for funding for Springfield, having the opportunity to learn when they get funding or we get the funding and share the results is priceless because we didn't have that before. We couldn't kind of share that. And I think that, as well bring us a lot of different opportunities because now is so many people helping us to be more creative and that's what our community needs it's not only one person feeling like i'm the god of this community and my organization is the community who do this and that now it's a whole community conversation regardless if it's mental health if it's like a schooling if it's youth seniors or adults, we really see the community as a whole and not by grand by grand. I think this is part of what I feel is important to highlight of all these years of working together. Yeah, thank you so much to Brother Al and for Anna for sharing. Um, yeah, it sounds like networking is key and in information sharing um, to make sure that we, we can all be creative in our strategies and inclusive um, and thinking about our neighbors. What about communities that aren't here? Like, you know, we I think a lot of the work is is very Springfield and Holyoke oriented. And, and I think some people have dropped off because of that. But how do you... How do folks think we can bring bring people back in um, to the conversation, or or you know, should we be focused just on Springfield and Holyoke, which is really the center of of where most of the inequities are? So just I think Becky, the for example, in our experience with the farmer market coach, that is speaking about projects getting communities together in the same um, in the same need. And I think, for example, in this case, food insecurity actually allow us to expand this conversation and networking outside of Holyoke and Springfield. Because as you notice, we working by working with CISA, we are expanding with Franklin County. We are supporting other farmer market that may or not has the funding and the knowledge to really launch these kind of projects with the independency and a little bit of uh, knowledge sharing. Not necessarily we need money to bind them together, but the necessity of the communities are so similar that by sharing a program, we share and open this communication channel. I think it's slowly by a steady, we all need to kind of invite those who in the past have the feeling that they were no here and it was always about Springfield and Holyoke. And I think working under the Hamden County as a whole, it, it makes the difference. We are open it up. And I think Ed Case is also uh, showing that it can be happened by having Liz going to the state. We are open it up. I think it is a hard kind of work to collectively put data together because it's invisible work. But I think uh, we all in this group are ambassadors of bringing big community together. And I think, I feel that we are doing it, but 
it's hard to tell or project in numbers. But I think Liz can agree with me. Every place she goes, she advocates for Holyoke, Springfield, and food in general for Western Mass or Hamden County. And I think by doing so and be present in as many meetings we can, I think we're going to, in some point, we're going to be very visible. Okay. And we are no advocates because I can, I, I, I know Brenda, Liz, and I, we are seen as challengers. And, you know, and I think it's, it's okay. Making people uncomfortable, that's okay. As soon as we get the attention we need, and the responses we need, I think it's okay. But we are being agitators more than uh, creating advocacy about food insecurity and food access in Western maps. And I feel proud of, I don't feel a shame of. Anna, you make a really good point. Um, and I, you know, people call me disruptors. Some of them call me names that are not as kind and I can live with that. Um, but feel but proud of. Yeah, and I'm struck by like our work with uh, <laughs> Universal Free Breakfast and Lunch. You know, it started yeah. here in Springfield. We were the first city to declare it. And then because I worked in food, I know poor white people in the hill towns. And I went to visit them and everyone told me I was crazy. And I said, you know, it's not your fault that your kids are going to school hungry. And that was yeah. the first time that anybody had said that to them. And it startled them that it was somebody who didn't look like them. And they asked me really like crazy questions. Well, why are black kids hungry? Y'all get more welfare than we do. And I'm like, everyone gets the same amount of welfare. It's based on family size. Everyone gets the same amount of food stamps. It's based on family size. So we had these profound conversations that were about race and how we're all jacked because we're told different stories about each other and we start to believe them. And some of those parents advocated even harder um, for universal breakfast and lunch. So that's why we do have to lift up the little towns. And I remember we had someone leave a meeting once because she felt like Springfield was sucking up all the money. And at that point, I think I was making $12,000. And I was like, well, I don't know where it is, but I want some of it. But it struck me just like the police, uh, the, the paradigm shift I had around the police slide that was in the presentation that we're all having our own experience and we don't know what the other experience is. And that's what the chip does, is it enables us to hear and see the whole broad experience. So we think we're doing, like, I know it's my job to advocate for Springfield, but I saw that I was marginalizing other communities in the way that I was doing it. And I am now saying yes and all the time whenever I can, because that's the way we need to do our work. Um, or at least that's the way I need to do my work. And I'm so grateful for all of you and for listening to me go on and on um, and for your championship. And I love these rebels who are like raising chickens and farming in Springfield. And pretty soon we won't be the rebels, right? We'll be the norm. So I wish everybody really, really well. And it's a beautiful day. I always say this, go outside. Ground yourself. We come from the soil. We will return to it. Take off your shoes if you can. Find somewhere that's not sprayed with pesticides. And just remember that this moment that we're having together as human beings is as real as all the muck and horror in the world. Be well, everybody. Yes, thank you. Thank you, everyone. And, and we put the uh, membership survey in the chat a couple of times. We'll be sending that out a lot. Um, but really appreciate you all staying and being with us today. So Great. Oh, thank you. Becky and Tiffany and PHI, PVC. You know, sometimes I struggle with intermediaries, but none of us could do the work that we do without them. And their work is often not seen. So we need to lift up that backbone support. It makes me sit up like this. Um, and um, so I appreciate you all very much. And Sharon, you. yes. congratulations. Your daughter's beautiful and the graduation was beautiful. I don't know if she's still here, but oh. see ya. Partnership, you? partnership you. is so important. <laughs> yes, it is. Bye. Thank you, everyone. Bye-bye. Thank you. Great meeting. Thank you.